right, our next session is gonna be a legislative update. Um, I'm gonna quickly introduce Kathy Kinsey, who is our new co-chair of the Government Affairs and Policy Committee for Mobilize Frederick. Uh, she spent much of her career in this area uh, working with, uh, as the senior policy advisor for the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management. Um, and prior to that was Deputy Secretary for Regulatory Programs at the Maryland Department of the Environment under Governor O'Malley. So um, Kathy will introduce our next speaker and uh, help moderate questions and discussion. Thanks. I hope this is right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, we're, we are gonna shift focus right now to the legislature, and I think um, everybody here realizes how critical a role the legislature is going to play this year and going forward um, in implementing um, key provisions of the Climate Pollution Reduction Plan. Um, I, we're very fortunate here today to have Jamie DeMarco with us this morning to talk about the 2024 session. Jamie is the Maryland Director of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network, CCAN, one of our sponsors, the summit sponsors. And for those of you who might not be familiar with CCAN, CCAN is a grassroots advocacy organization. It was established more than two decades ago to put the Maryland, uh, DC, Virginia, regional area um, on a uh, strong path to climate stability. And CCAN has been, uh, for its uh, long existence, has been very engaged with legislative and uh, regulatory climate adv advocacy at both the state and federal levels and has worked on a r wide range of regulatory um, climate initiatives, community solar programs, um, setting goals for wind power, building electrification, transportation electrification, which we just heard about from um, Rachel Lamb, all key um, um, uh, um, elements of our uh, plan to achieve our climate goals, and climate justice, of course, um, another very important aspect of of uh, achieving, achieving um, our climate goals. A little bit about Jamie. Uh, Jamie joined CCAN in 2020 to set up a federal climate advocacy department um, at CCAN and also to lead the organization's work in Maryland. Jamie has been uh, passionate about climate action since before his college days at Warren Wilson College in North Carolina, where he majored in chemistry and environmental sciences. And one of the things that he's most proud of um, is the successful fossil fuel divestment campaign that he helped lead when he was at Warren Wilson. And his school was actually the first of 12 schools in the US to successfully divest their fossil fuel uh, portfolios. So that, that is quite an accomplishment for such a young person. Um, after college, he helped found the Maryland Clean Energy Jobs Initiative in 2018 to pass the Clean Energy Jobs Act, and then he went on to state-level advocacy work for the Citizens uh, Climate Lobby. As CCAN's Maryland director, he is tasked with, among many other things, leading CCAN's legislative climate advocacy efforts in, in Maryland. So, uh, as you all know, this promises to be another very busy session in Annapolis. Already we have more than 1,600 bills that have been filed, and um, we, 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 you know, we are likely to get more since the deadline for filing uh, is uh, on both sides is coming up next week. Um, there are a number of really important key climate bills that are needed to implement elements of the state's new climate reduction plan, which have been introduced or will be introduced in this year's session. The bill that I know that Jamie is most excited to talk about is the Renew Act. Um, and this is truly a piece of landmark legislation. If the Renew Act passes the legislature and is signed into law by the government, it will be a big game changer for climate programs in Maryland, particularly our resiliency programs. So without further ado, since we only have a half an hour, I'm gonna turn it over to Jamie now to talk about that bill and several other uh, climate bills that are on CCAN's priority list this year. And we are going to leave some time at the end for questions. Um, so um, be thinking about what you wanna know about the legislation that's pending this year um, as you hear Jamie's presentation.
Thank you. It's good to see everyone. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Um, I didn't coordinate with Dr. Lamb, but this is my first slide, and this is my second slide. I promise that the, the rest of our presentations will be different. But first of all, I wanted to just take a moment to recognize both this plan and everyone in this room. I think the, the great promise of this slide is, is one, what we have to accomplish and what we can do, but also this speaks to what we have accomplished over the past 20 years together. And so for everyone in this room who has taken action in some form to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in Maryland, build political will for a better future, and help make this graph on the left what it is today, we're already on track to cut our emissions in half, just give yourself a round of applause. Um, and as Dr. Lamb said, Maryland does have the most ambitious greenhouse gas reduction targets in the country, and this plan achieves those, country, those targets, which means this is also the most ambitious greenhouse gas reduction plan in the country, and Governor Moore and his team at MDE and others created it. So just give a round of applause to Governor Moore, Dr. Lamb, and everyone at MDE. The plan includes a lot of very specific um, recommendations. Oh, I thought I'd have an animation here. Um, <laughs> you can see behind the dollar sign, there's lots of great things like the zero emission equipment standard that would require all new heating equipment, both for space heating and water heating, to be met without the use of fossil fuels. So if somebody's furnace broke down, they actually couldn't get a new gas furnace. They would have to find a zero emission equivalent, which is incredible policy, along with all these others. And as Dr. Lamb said, Combined, we need to be spending a billion dollars investing, a billion dollars a year achieving this goal every year between now and 2031. A billion dollars a year. As she said, that is going to pay itself over many times over in job benefits, in health benefits, in reduced extreme weather events. It's going to pay itself over many times. It's one of the best investments we can make, but we have got to make those investments. And we're going to talk about a way that we can make those investments without it coming from Marylanders, as Dr. Lamb said, but instead making the polluters pay. And, these, um, and that bill that I'm going to talk to you first about today before I talk about some other bills in the legislature is the RENEW Act, which stands for Responding to Emergency Needs from Extreme Weather. How about that acronym? Um, this is a, a tremendous bill that we will get into the details of, but the first thing to know about it is that it brings new revenue into the state from giant out-of-state fossil fuel companies. And then, yeah, yeah, let's have a round of applause for that. And the need for this revenue is so essential because we need to be spending a billion dollars a year on climate. And this is coming at a time when that is not easy for the state to do. The state is projected to have a budget shortfall in the billions of dollars in the very near future. And that's because of a few factors, including federal COVID dollars going away and also increasing um, the amount of money we are investing in our public education, which is also very important. But all that to say, dollars are not easy to come by at the state level right now which is why we need a dedicated solution that is going to bring in new revenue. We cannot count on just getting this billion dollars a year from other sources um, in the existing revenue. And as somebody mentioned, in addition to solving climate change in Maryland, we also need to survive climate change in Maryland and survive it equitably. And this bill would, would bring in revenue to do both. We are experiencing more extreme weather events. This, this of course, is a picture of Ellicott City that experienced two once in a thousand year rain events in the span of just two years. That is? That's your daughter? <laughs> I'm sorry for your daughter and her car. Um, Howard County is currently spending $228 million to bore an 18-foot diameter granite tunnel, tunnel through granite bedrock underneath Ellicott City to prevent flooding like this from happening again. That's $228 million. 20 years ago, we might have sat here and talked about the projected costs of climate change, but we're sitting here today watching these costs come out of line items of this year's budget. These are costs that could have gone to public schools, that could have gone to opioid prevention, could have gone to any other thing that we want to do as a state, but instead are being eaten up just to survive the wetter wets and hotter hots we are already experiencing. This is a road in Prince George's County. This was, you know, an incredible thing. These aren't even hurricanes. These are just rainy days. Uh, this is a day where it didn't even rain. This is sunny day flooding on the eastern shore. Somebody mentioned sunny day flooding in Annapolis. We actually had a rally in support of this bill on the first day of session this year in Annapolis talking about the need for this funding to survive climate change. And there had actually been a big storm the day before, and there were storefronts in Annapolis that were closed because there was still water 
on the street and in the store um, on that day as we were having that press conference. And there's also saltwater intrusion. We recently spoke with a woman named Betty in Crisfield, Maryland, who has lived there for 35 years. She used to farm her property, and the field she used to farm, or have farmers farm, is now totally, nothing grows there. It's barren, because as sea level rises, the salt from that ocean has contaminated the land, and you can plant all you want, but nothing is gonna grow. Um, this is a picture of somebody who spent their, uh, a sizable amount of money to jack their home up a few feet just to be able to survive those higher tides. And we also know that the heat waves are coming. This past September and this past June, schools in Maryland had to close because it was too hot to operate without air conditioning, and there are public schools that don't have air conditioning. And it will cost seven, more than $700 million to install air conditioning in every public school that needs it in Maryland, and that is on top of the investments in public education we need to make just to improve the outcomes in public education. And we know that these heat island event, events are worse in places that have been historically redlined due to lack of tree cover, and the heat island event effect is worse there. And that is part of why when we passed the Tree Solutions Now Act of 2021, 40% of the funding for those trees had to go to historically redlined neighborhoods, but this effect is very real. All that to say, we're feeling the costs here and now, but we can have a better world. If we make these investments now, I love this slide, we can be whatever we have the courage to see. We can have great public space that's rich um, in natural spaces and has stormwater management, public transportation, everything we want. But it's gonna take an investment to get there. And what the Renew Act would do, it's about time I actually talked about what the bill would do. It would say, if you are a company that has emitted more than 1 billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions between 2000 and 2020, then you have to pay into a fund. And that fund will be $900 million a year for 10 years. And that money will be invested in Maryland to both reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and make the necessary investments to survive the hotter hots and wetter wets that we are experiencing. And that money would go to a lot of different things, including the Comprehensive Flood Mitigation Fund that can you know, install rain gardens and other things, install culverts. 40 years ago, nine inches of rain was a once in a hundred year rain event. And today, nine inches of rain is a once in 10 year rain event. And none of our stormwater management systems are equipped to handle that increased precipitation. So there is already a Comprehensive Flood Mitigation Fund that has some money in it. And that money gets used like that. There is so much demand for this Comprehensive Flood Mitigation Fund because everybody doesn't want to experience that flooding and everybody knows it's coming. So we put additional funds there. Last year, uh, we created a great new fund in Maryland called the State Disaster Relief Fund. Really grateful to Governor Moore for signing it. There's just one problem with this fund, which is that there's currently no money in it. Um, and so the Renew Act would also take some of this money and put it into the State Disaster Relief Fund, which is important. If a tornado strikes, it can take days for FEMA to arrive, and we want to make sure there's relief there the same day, which is what Maryland can do if we have money in our own state disaster relief fund. And we also want to put funds into the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities, which is, an, we know that it's important to make sure everyone has quality, affordable health care. If we are going to be surviving the heat waves, if somebody goes to the hospital with heat stroke, it's important that they have coverage and can be treated. And we would also put additional funds into the Strategic Energy Investment Fund, which is a current fund in Maryland. It usually, you know, um, people think of it as getting about $50 million a year, but that's where we, that's the closest thing we currently have to the fund where we're investing in all the things we need to. It invests in building more clean energy and insulation and ratepayer assistance. Every, <laughs> whenever someone's trying to do a great climate program in Maryland, they usually come for Strategic Energy Investment Funds because that's sort of the designated pot and it would greatly increase the amount of money in that pot so we can do more of all the great things we're already doing. Fund zero emission school buses, and also hiring additional agency staff. There's so much that we can do that's not gonna cost us money, but we need the administrative capacity in order to do it. We don't wanna be overworking folks, and we can't be taking on more than we can chew. So these are just a few of the great things that we can do with more money. We can have nice things. We can implement all these policies. We can survive climate change through funding all these additional programs. And the best thing is, as I mentioned, the money would not come from Marylanders. Right now, Marylanders are paying for all of these climate costs. This is the thing, right now we're paying for all of it. Every cost that I just went through is not something that is projected, that we're thinking is gonna happen, that we're estimating or modeling. Those are all costs that we are experiencing 
today. And what the Renew Act would do is say, hey, Maryland, you're holding a lot of these costs. We're going to take it off your shoulders and put it on the shareholders of these about 40 companies, none of which are based in Maryland, all of which sell our product in Maryland. And they would not be able to pass this cost on as well because it'd be about 40 companies paying this one-time penalty for their historical emissions. And those companies would still have to compete in the marketplace with all the hundreds of others who are not paying this penalty and would not raise their prices. And any effort to all raise their prices together would be illegal. This policy was also first introduced by Senator Van Hollen in Congress, I should say. We're really proud of Senator Van Hollen. He introduced this in 2021, where it um, almost became part of the Build Back Better Act. I think if we had one more vote in the Senate, it would have become law um, at the national level, but that didn't happen. And it was taken up by the states in Massachusetts, Vermont, New York have all introduced this legislation, actually passed the Senate in New York last year, but has not yet become law anywhere. So this is the second year we are all introducing it here at the state level. And we have a lobby night in Annapolis on February 19th where we're going to talk about this bill and the other bills I'm going to talk about. If you're free February 19th, the best way to influence your lawmaker is to meet with them in person. Everyone is a person, including lawmakers, and people respond to face-to-face -face stories that they hear from other people. And that's just a really powerful thing to do. I encourage folks um, to go to the Chesapeake Climate Action Network website um, and sign up for the lobby night if you're free that night. But the Renew Act is not the only legislation coming before us this year. There's a lot of other important bills that I will try to go through quickly, including empower reform. Back in the early 2000s, um, the grid operators went to the O'Malley administration and said, we're going to have to build a lot more coal plants because energy demand is going to explode. You have no idea. There's going to be so much more energy. We've got to build a lot more power plants. And Governor O'Malley said, what if instead of building a lot more power plants, we did something for a fraction of the money we created an energy efficiency program and just prevented that energy demand from ever being created. And that's exactly what they did. They created Empower Maryland, a program that's been extremely effective at actually over the past uh, decade and a half, Maryland has reduced its electricity demand because of energy efficiency gains largely from the Empower program. However, we are now at a new point where we are no longer trying to just increase efficiency, we are trying to get to zero emissions. And uh, we actually want electricity demand to increase because we are trying to electrify everything. And right now, um, you know, I have a home where I have a gas furnace. I'm waiting for it to break before replacing it. But I get mail from the state, from the Empower program, and it says, Jamie, we know you have an old inefficient gas furnace. We would love to help pay for a new gas furnace for you that's more efficient and will save 20% of your gas use because you're buying a more um, efficient gas furnace. And so the state is actually subsidizing that. And that is bad policy, because if I get a new gas furnace, you know, the gas furnace I have right now was built in the 90s. And if I get a new one, it'll be operating well after 2045, which is not what we want. And so there's legislation this year that will change the Empower program to be from a program that en encourages efficiency and reducing electricity use to a program that fundamentally incentivizes reducing greenhouse gas emissions and encourages electrification. This is a really important bill. A lot of utilities are fighting various provisions in it. Um, it's important that we get it through. It is also really important that we take trash incineration out of the state's renewable portfolio standard. We have a renewable portfolio standard right now, and it gives a lot of money to a lot of different energy sources, and it helps us build a lot of wind and solar. We would not be where we are right now without our renewable portfolio standard. But this is a trash incinerator in southern Baltimore next to a highway, and this is clearly an environmental injustice community. And the state is subsidizing it as clean energy as if it were a windmill or a turbine. And it's a waste of money because they aren't even burning more trash or building, the, nothing is changing because we're subsidizing this facility. It existed for decades before these subsidies. It'll exist for decades after the subsidies um, unless we shut it down. But we should not be wasting good dollars that should go to wind and solar on this facility. Um, and there's a bill this year introduced by Senator Karen Lewis Young on the Senate side that would take trash incineration out of the RPS. And that's a really important one. There is also a bill called the Better uh, Building a Better Maryland. The bill itself is called um, the Better Buildings Act that would set new energy efficiency standards for new buildings and require all new buildings to meet their space and water heating needs without the use of fossil fuels. Because we should not be building new buildings full of gas furnaces. As I said, my gas furnace was built in 1990. So if you, nobody lays a pipe in the ground and expects to dig that pipe up and retire it in 21 years. 
And it's hard to believe that 2045 is just 21 years away. The year 2003 is closer than the year 2045, or at least as close. Um, nobody puts a pipe in the ground and expects to retire it in 21 years. So every time that we build a new building that has gas powered, we are incurring a debt because somebody over the next 21 years is gonna have to pay to dig up that pipe and retire it before the end of its useful lifetime. It makes no sense to be putting gas into new buildings if we wanna to get to net zero by 2045, which we want to do. The very lowest of low hanging fruit to decarbonizing the building sector is tackling new buildings because we know it is more cost effective to build a new building that is all electric and to operate a new building that is all electric. So this will bring down the cost of new buildings, of housing, um, and it will also help us meet our climate goals. It's a very simple bill. It also has some energy efficiency standards in it. There's another bill that uh, was mentioned earlier that the governor is bringing that would exempt new backup diesel generators, which is what these are, for data centers from the Certificate of Public Convenience and Need, CPCN process, which is the regulatory process and which governs all new power plants. And the governor wants to exempt these from that process. Karen Lewis Young, I know, is working with the governor to try to make changes to this bill, and I think she'll have an amendment package. I encourage folks to speak to Senator Lewis Young um, if they're interested in <laughs> um, not supporting this bill that the governor is bringing. Because, uh, you know, it, if, as we're trying to get to zero emissions and 100% clean energy by 2035, it doesn't make a lot of sense to make it easier to build new fossil fuel power plants. <laughs> um, and that is the end of my PowerPoint. Um, I, you know, the Renew Act is an important bill that'll bring in the revenue for all the things that we need, and I went through some of the other priority bills that we are working on. Um, I don't want to end on this slide, though. While we take questions, I'm just going to bring us back to this one, which is my favorite slide. Thank you, Jamie. That was a great update. Um, so we can take questions now from the audience. So there's two mics, so um, folks should line up. Um, you have questions about that legislation that he's talked about or any other bill that he hasn't mentioned. Um, and to kick us off, I, I have a, a question for you, Jamie. Um, uh, this is on the Renew Act. So the, re, a very similar piece of legislation was introduced last year um, in, the, in the session, in the 2023 session. It never really made it out of committee. What uh, do you think the prospects are for this legislation passing this year? Um, the Renew Act is a, it's going to be difficult to pass this year, but we have a chance. It brings in new revenue, and that ties us to larger conversations about revenue for the overall state. Lawmakers have said that they want to raise revenue one year, not multiple years. They want to do it all in one year. So whichever year we end up raising a lot of revenue, we hope that this will be included in the package of bills that does that. Um, and we're pushing really hard for this year, but we're hearing some rumors that that package is actually going to move next year. But we're not giving up on this year. You know, Chesapeake Climate Action Network has a motto of building the biggest coalition possible and then never, ever, ever giving up. And that's what we plan to do for this bill. And we're pushing as hard to get it through this year as we can. So um, no questions? Um, another question, um, Jamie. And this is, this is about um, another bill uh, in the legislature, um, which is, um, I think, uh, also uh, could be a very big revenue raising bill uh, to assist us with climate mm -hmm. programs. And that's the, um, the EJ Act, the Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act. Can you talk a little bit about what that bill would do? The Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act is an incredible bill. Chesapeake Climate Action Network first brought this bill to Maryland years ago and has been working on it for many years along with Climate Exchange and WANDRA. And we fully support this bill. It would. Um, you know, the Renew Act is not a tax. It's a one-time payment on a small number of companies. The Climate Crisis and Environmental Justice Act more explicitly puts a price on carbon across the economy um, and says, you know, this many, for every ton of greenhouse gas emissions you emit, you need to pay this amount. And then it has a lot of ratepayer protections to make sure that those costs don't get passed along, um, but it's a much more straightforward way of doing it. The Renew Act is a little more innovative um, in trying a new idea. It's more based on like a climate, on like a super fund 
It's the model where if a company or group of companies have contaminated a site, they've got to pay to clean it up. That just the site happens to be the global atmosphere this time. Um, and those are some of the differences, but we definitely support both. And we need the revenue from both, so we'd love to see both pass. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I have a question. Could you go back to the slide that had the chart? This one? Yes. So uh, the current population in Maryland is 6.1 million. In 2030, it's going to be 8.5 which is an increase of 39%, and by 2050, it's 9.7 million. So my question is, I'm looking at the, and I'm really glad you brought the incinerator, incinerator thing up, because I'm very concerned about waste management, and it sort of looks flat between those two. That's one question, and then quickly, transportation also is a concern for me in terms of water transportation with ships um, and their emissions and what we can do about that too. So if you could help me understand. Thanks that. for those questions. On waste management, um, the Chesapeake Climate Action Network has worked with the uh, Moore administration to create regulations governing landfill methane, methane from landfills. You know, if you have a banana peel and you throw it in the trash and that trash goes to a landfill, that banana peel is gonna break down anaerobically, which means instead of turning to carbon dioxide, it's gonna turn into methane, which we know is 80 times more effective at creating global warming than CO2 over a 20-year lifespan. And so that's where that, a lot of that waste management emissions come from, is from landfills. And there, we, Maryland is now a leader in having some of the strongest emissions controls on landfill methanes, on methane from landfills in terms of capturing that methane and making sure that that methane doesn't make it into the atmosphere and is instead converted back to CO2, which is still bad, but not as bad as methane. And that's, I think, maybe why we see that dip in the late 2025s in waste management. And maybe that's compensating for some of the growth in the population and the increased trash. I don't know if ship emissions um, are included in this emissions um, breakdown. And so I could get back to you on that. Let me just say on ship emissions, I, I think a lot of that area is regulated by the federal government. So I'm not sure with, you know, to what extent states are actually preempted from regulating um, shipping emissions directly. Uh, by quick question on clarification, the Renew Act, is that the Producer Responsibilities Act that was presented before? Is that the same thing? Um, trying to make the producers responsible for it is, it is not the same as Producer Responsibility Act. I think it's slightly different, but doing a, a similar thing. A similar thing, thing. Yeah. okay. The other thing is I'm, I'm a huge advocate of composting waste diversion. Um, all about having the Bresco um, not considered renewable um, in the portfolio. My concern is we don't have a lot of capacity for options. So as much as I don't want Bresco and trash incineration to be something that we're doing anymore, we need to have increased capacity on composting, waste diversion, and everything else. So if we pass this bill and, and, and take that tax responsibility away from, from Bresco, will it close? And if it does, we don't have the capacity to handle all the waste that it doesn't, that it currently handles. So you know, I, we, want, we want incineration out, we want composting, we want waste diversion, but we don't have capacity just yet. So, and, and getting landfills permitted in Maryland is extremely difficult. So how can we handle the short term while we get to the long term? Great question. The Bresco faci uh, facility was built in 1985. It didn't enter the tier one renewable portfolio standard until 2011. So it existed for all of those decades without any state subsidy. And if you look at a graph of the amount of trash it's burned every year, you c the graph is entirely flat. And in the middle of that graph is the year we started subsidizing it. So there's actually no evidence that the subsidies have caused it to burn more trash. And uh, we do want to close it down, but in the short term, we don't think that it will, um, ending the subsidies will cause less trash to be burned. I'll, um, I'll also say, I think we can take one more question, and I just want to make a plug before we do that. Chesapeake Climate Action Network is a people-powered movement in Maryland, um, and Mobilize, we are great partners with Mobilize Frederick. We love Mobilize Frederick. And if you or your friends want to get involved with Chesapeake Climate Action Network, please Google Chesapeake Climate Action Network. I'm sure we will come up and would love to work with you and sign up and we'll get you engaged and let you know how you can help on all of these bills and keep informed. Last question. Thank 
you. Uh, my name is Hannah Nickerson. I'm here representing Sustainability Solutions, which is an environmental sustainability consultancy for businesses. Uh, I'm also here with uh, a nonprofit organization in the city. Unfortunately, what I've been seeing is a lot of these sustainability design principles are right now viewed as above and beyond. Uh, they're not really governed by any compliance or code within the city uh, or the, the county or the state. Um, there's a lot of good work happening, as you've mentioned, and I completely agree that legislation is a necessary step in the right direction. What advice do you have uh, being an organizer yourself where you know maybe this area which is experiencing explosive growth uh, where we could maybe do our best to accelerate passing you know building energy performance standards or certain com you know sustainable urban design uh, wh what advice do you have for us to organize better as a community to get some of this stuff going thanks um, quickly I will say that as was mentioned at the top, we will address climate change through a tipping point of political will where we can get climate action at every level of government for decades sustained. So we need the county level, we need the state level, and we need the federal level, and we need it everywhere. Um, and so pick a specific outcome that you want, It'd be, it'd be new building codes or your own building energy performance standards. We have state building energy performance standards that require all buildings over 25,000 square feet to eliminate the greenhouse gas emissions by 2045. That was a big win included in the Climate Solutions Now Act. Um, Montgomery County has more strict building energy performance standards. Frederick County could also do the same and create their own. But my advice would be to pick something specific, set a timeline to get it done, and build a campaign around it. Um, as I said, our two key to success pieces of advice are one, Start by building the largest coalition possible, and two, never, ever, ever, ever give up. That's what we got. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. That was great.